Hello. So um, today, today's reading was, oh, actually, before I start discussing that, um, I was hoping to have all the midterm assignments back by Thursday, that is by Thanksgiving, but um, uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to get them back by Monday. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, so today's reading was these three, I guess you could say, direct critics of Popper. Um, in some ways, they're very different from each other. So, two of them we've already seen before as critics of Carnap. And the last one, Imre Lakatos, um, well, uh, his whole career, as you can tell even from the beginning of the reading, was uh, a response to Popper. Um, so all three of them begin with kind of uh, respectful remarks about how important a figure Popper is. Um, but then you can see by the way they frame those and the way they go on that they're really coming at him from very different points of view. And I mean, by different points of view, I mean not in terms of what their doctrine is, right? Like what they believe, but in terms of what their relationship is to Popper. So, um, like, the moral of Neurath's paper is basically uh, Popper is not one of us. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, I mean, he really makes his case from that for that towards the very end of the paper where the conclusion is kind of like, oh, look how Popper shows so much respect to the old bad philosophy like Kant or whatever. Um, and it's not surprising because, uh, as we've seen all along, Popper is not really on board with our program. Right. So, um, you know, he did use some ideas that were developed by us. Um, and there's a few isolated lessons we can learn from him. But basically, you know, the moral is uh, don't be taken in. Don't think Popper is part of our program. And the main lesson we can learn from him is what? not to do. <laughs> um, so that's Neurath. Putnam's point of view is quite different, um, um, partly because Putnam is treating Popper, as he treated Carnap, as a member of the old generation, right? So as opposed to Neurath, who's treating Popper as a potential colleague or competitor, Putnam is treating Popper as um, um, part of the generation he's trying to succeed. <laughs> um, and, um, and what he says on the positive side about Popper is that, well, at least Popper is on the right side, that is Putnam's side, in certain debates that Putnam is having with the positivists. Um, so, in fact, the thing that Putnam most likes about Popper is um, the very thing that ends up being Neurath's most serious charge against Popper, namely that Popper believes in a real world <laughs> and thinks that our theories can be true or false depending on what the real world is actually like. Um, But nevertheless, Putnam's main take on Popper is that in many ways he's no better than the Vienna Circle positivists. Um, he's just a, another part of the same old generation that are all involved in their kind of intricate 
theoretical disputes with one another and meanwhile are completely out of touch with what's actually going on. Um, and I'm putting it that way deliberately because as I you know, have suggested, I think, before in lecture and as suggested in one of the possible paper prompts um, that uh, this reaction of Putnam to Carnap and Popper is going on in the context of Putnam being one of the young generation, the so-called new left that's arising in the 60s. Um, and his criticism of them within philosophy is related to the type of criticism that the new left charges against the older generation of liberals and the old left. Um, so, um, and, uh, you know, if you read Putnam's paper carefully, you can see that, you know, he, he slips in that connection himself in certain places. And uh, in particular, he says that Popper is, in a way, worse than the positivists because uh, not only is he not uh, on board with what actually has to be done to change the world, he's actually a, a quote-unquote reactionary. And he proves that he's a reactionary by showing that Popper's view, which, I mean, to Popper, like this is part of Popper's point, but for Putnam, this is a, a charge against him, showing that Popper's view rules out Marxism. Okay, um, as I've mentioned before, this at this time, although by the time I knew Putnam, he was not like this, but at this time, so I've heard, he was uh, like standing out, standing in Harvard Square, handing out like Maoist literature and. So, um, okay, and so therefore the tone of Popper's reply. Now, um, I didn't assign Popper's reply, although that would be great to read, but I thought there was too much reading already. But I am going to quote from some of Popper's replies here. This is not the right part, though. Um, I need page 993. This uh, Schilp volume, the philosophy of Karl Popper, is um, incredibly long, as you can see from the fact that this is on page 993. Uh, but and it's got some other interesting stuff in it. You can see right before his reply to Putnam is a reply to Quine. But anyway, this is the beginning of Popper's reply to Putnam in that volume. I enjoyed reading Professor Hilary Putnam's paper because it is crisply and clearly written. But Professor's Put Professor Putnam's conclusions are all wrong. <laughs> Professor Putnam is a leader of the younger generation of logicians, while I am a tottering old metaphysician. This is perhaps the explanation of why he found it unnecessary to do his homework. <laughs> so, I mean, like, uh, this is kind of nasty, but um, and it may, in a way, might seem unprovoked by Putnam's paper. But I think if you understand the context, it kind of is provoked. Um, and he goes on to say in the on the next page. In general, he has not read, or if or if read, not understood what I have written, some of which happens to be very similar to, but older than, a very interesting paper of Putnam's to which he refers in his footnote one, right? So he's saying that not only has Putnam not read his work carefully, but if he had read his work carefully, he would see that Popper already said a long time ago stuff that Putnam thinks is his own new thesis. Um, okay, so that's Putnam. Obviously, I'm coming back to all these people. This is just a preliminary discussion. And finally, um, Lakatosh. Um, well, so Lakatosh's paper, again, begins by respectful remarks, but in his case, they're personal. 
right? He says, you know, Popper is the one who freed me from the influence of Hegel. Actually, if you read Lakatosh's paper, you'll see that there's still quite a bit of influence of Hegel. <laughs> um, but never mind that. Popper is the one who freed me from the influence of Hegel and um, uh, and provided me with, with my research program. I'm continuing his research program, of course, critically. But that's the way you continue a research program, he says. Um, and so when Lakatosh eventually asks on page 245, under what conditions would you give up your demarcation criterion, Popper? Um, this actually is kind of a poignant personal question coming from Lakatosh, right? I mean, it's not um, a wise aleck in the back of the room, which actually is how Popper you know, categorizes it in his, his response. It's not like some, you know, undergrad in the back of the room saying, hey, Popper, what about your theory? Is it falsifiable? Right? What Lakatosh is saying is, like, what he's asking is, under what circumstances would you accept my criticism of you and my continuation in a different direction as legitimate? And Popper's response is, um, I mean, it's after Lakatosh's death. As you, if you, if you read the little editorial footnote at the beginning, you'll see that Lakatosh uh, died before this could be this volume was printed. Um, but uh, it is maybe uh, in this case a little. Well, it's not nasty the way his response to Putnam is. I mean, it's kind of more in sorrow than anger, but still, it's maybe a little mean considering who Lakatosh is. And, uh, oops, this one. Now that I am called on to reply to his views, I am disturbed to find that the argument which appears to be crucial for his criticism of my views on demarcation must, in my opinion, be rejected as totally unsound. You see, I mean, why do I say this is a little bit mean? He could have said, I find myself unable to understand why Lakatosh thinks this is a good argument or something like that. Right? I mean, there's a way of responding to someone when you can't see any merit in your argument, but you respect them. Um, in any case, so that's not what he does. That among his criticism, he raises points which I would not have expected from one who was well acquainted with my work. Again, you could say, I'm not sure I understand his points. They don't, I know he's very well acquainted with my work. So, you know, I mean, because like Lakatosh says stuff about like this about Popper in his paper, right? Like for years, I've tried to understand whether he means this or that. Anyway, um, and that his examination of my views seems to have left him and unfortunately large numbers of people who have read his papers with an interpretation of my theory of falsifiability that makes nonsense of all my views. All right, so um, that's both an introduction to, you know, from what point of view these people are criticizing Popper. Um, well, introduction, I mean, the rest of my lecture is mostly you know, about common themes that appear in all three of them. So this is the introduction and conclusion of different ways these people are related to Popper and how Popper response to them. Um, Neurath's paper, of course, you know, is old and is not a contribution to this volume. I don't know if Popper ever responded to it in detail or not. Um, Neurath died sometime in the 30s, I believe unlike Carnap and Popper, who lived on for decades. Um, okay, so I'm going to erase this list.
Okay, so um, so although they're coming at him from these like very different positions politically slash personally, um, there are common themes in what they all say about him. Um, um, and they also, I think, have in common that uh, Popper, Popper is right to say that in some sense they all misread him. Um, or at least if they don't actually misread him, they present his views in a way that's, that encourages misreading. Um, so what I mean by that is like, if, you know, if you're going to criticize someone, especially someone you recognize at the beginning of your paper as a major figure and has been very helpful and so forth, um, you would expect that what you should do is then build them up as much as possible, right? Like give them all their arguments present the most uh, considered version of their view. Um, and then, you know, say, nevertheless, I don't think this will work because blah, blah, blah. But instead, what they, what all of them do, I think, is, I mean, Lakatosh is the one who's, who expresses the most hesitation over this. And he even says, if you read my other longer papers, you'll see uh, like a different treatment. But what all three of them do in these papers that we have anyway, is um, basically to take on a really simplified version of Popper. And then at some point raise, oh, Popper might respond, or this is the place where Popper says something like, and then kind of wave it away. So, like, even if maybe at some point they actually have acknowledged what he would really say, they did it in a way that's very misleading. Um, you can actually see an extreme version of this going back to the Schilt volume. That, uh, Popper quotes from Ayer's contribution. Ayer was uh, um, kind of the key figure in first translating the Vienna Circle philosophy into English and representing it in Oxford. Um, so um, anyway, uh, Ayer's, uh, this is, Popper's quote from Ayer, as Professor Ayer blames me because I, quote, found it necessary to modify in the manner described here. So the manner described here is right above this, right? Like before Popper responds to each of his critics in detail, he says certain general things like, okay, this is what I did. And, you know, um, so like what he said right before this is, you know, he's explained in detail how he never said that theories should be falsified based on one falsifying basic statement. I, it was always a methodological criterion and not just a logical criterion, et cetera. And then at the end of it, he says, as Professor Ayer blames me because I quote, found it necessary to modify in the manner described here, my principle of falsifiability in the course of this very book, Logik der Forschung, that is the logic of scientific discovery. Popper says in parentheses, in fact, in the course of its very first chapter. <laughs> um, right, so in other words, what Ayer did in, in his contribution is to say, you know, here's, po here's Popper's criterion of falsifiability. It's ridiculous, as you can see from the fact that Popper himself couldn't stick to it in his own book. Right, so like as Popper points out, not only didn't he stick to it in the whole book, he said already right in the first chapter that, 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 that what Ayer is calling his criterion of falsifiability is not the whole criterion, <laughs> right? He didn't stick to it because he knew to begin with that it wasn't that simple. 
right? And he says, I gladly accept the blame. It turned out to be more fertile than sticking dogmatically for years to a long ago refuted sterile criterion of meaningfulness. Right, so, um, um, so they, um, now, I mean, you know, I didn't assign Ayer's contribution. Uh, I assigned these because, you know, they're not that extreme, but I do think they fall somewhat into the same, uh, fall somewhat under the same criticism. But um, on the other hand, Popper's responses also to some extent involve misreadings of them. Um, and more importantly, I guess, you know, uh, leaving aside all the misreadings, there actually are some serious issues here. Um, and the misreadings of each other just kind of serve to obscure them. Um, are there questions about this so far? I haven't been monitoring the chat. Okay. Um, so one thing that they all say about Popper, right, so I'm going on now to discuss those common themes. So one thing that they all say about Popper is that he wants too much, logical purity, or he treats science with too much logical purity. Um, right, that is, he expects from science clean distinctions, uh, definite decisions in advance about what a theory says, um, about what the terms mean. Um, and he's, he proposes his methodology for science on the assumption that science is trying to live up to that demand. Right? I mean, of course, he knows that uh, in real life, science isn't written in, you know, formal logic, um, that, uh, you know, there's various kinds of messiness in the way it's actually practiced. But as Neurath says, and I, I mean, I think, you know, he's in uh, Marxist terms, he's raising, you know, like technically the theory of ideology or whatever, but I mean, you don't have to know that to understand what he says. He says, you know, Popper is like, his treatment of science is always in relation to this ideal. Um, And, you know, I mean, basically, they all would uh, accuse Carnap of the same thing, I think. In fact, uh, um, Neurath and Putnam, I think we've seen accuse Carnap of the same thing. Uh, Lakatos implies he's not really interested in an inductivist because he thinks that Popper has already superseded them. But he also says, yeah, and they, you know, Popper has, is still doing some of the bad things that they did. Um, so I, you know, as far as this goes, it's not necessarily a criticism of Popper in particular. Um, um, but I think it applies to Popper in a particular way. And that, you know, um, so just to go, uh, you know, okay, so, so what is Popper missing? by expecting this kind of logical purity from science. Well, um, here's how Neurath puts it. 
Can you read that or should I magnify it more? Right, so um, um, Neurath, in the context of saying that what scientists really have is not just theories, but quote unquote encyclopedias, I'll get back to that a little bit. But he says, you know, when we choose whether something's a good encyclopedia, um, one of the things we're looking at is whether it um, preserves a certain kind of uh, continuity with our old site or I'm not sure here if he means within it like between the older articles and the newer ones so to speak or with our old with the old edition or something like that I'm not sure how the metaphor works but so just the continuity of formulations however plays a great part in the selection of model encyclopedias such continuity rests in part on constant use of quaternio terminorum, right? So quaternio terminorum, <laughs> this is something that comes up in 106, the Kant course, also. If anyone has taken that with me, you will remember terminorum. It's, it's, it refers to the logical fallacy of the four terms. Right, which means that in a syllogism, uh, there's supposed to be three terms. All A is B, but all B is C, therefore all A is C. But uh, if the middle term doesn't mean the same thing the two times it occurs in the two premises, then the conclusion isn't valid. So that's called the fallacy of the four terms. Now, I mean, Neurod isn't talking about a syllogism here, literally, so it's not important if you didn't understand what I just said, but it means that um, the continuity happens by, like, we go from A, B, to, you know, C, B, and so we say, oh, there's continuity because B still occurs in both. But in fact, this B doesn't mean the same thing as that, that B. And yet Neurod is saying, this is actually part of how science advances by doing this. So like if you take the term electron, you know, it doesn't mean the same thing now as it meant for Bohr, and it didn't mean the same thing for Bohr that it meant for Rutherford or whatever, right? Uh, and yet uh, our theory preserves a continuity of formulations. Certain things that you could say about the electron before, like that it has unit negative charge, you can still say about it now, even though what it means is different. <laughs> um, um, right, so that's a kind of lack of... Oh, you probably couldn't see. Could you see when I wrote any of this on the board? I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget to switch back. This is quaternio terminorum, and this is what I was explaining, the continuity, right? It looks like there's some continuity between these two stages, because although A has changed to C, B remains the same. But if B is, let's say, the word electron, and B doesn't mean the same thing here that it meant there, then... Um, from like a strict, like logically pure or clean point of view, there is no continuity, right? Since it doesn't mean the same thing, I could call it anything. I could call it, you know, electron, and then it wouldn't. There wouldn't be any continuity, right? So, but what Neurath is saying is that in the actual progress of science, this logically messy, impure move is actually important. Um, and Lakatos, you know, is making a similar point when he talks about research programs continuing through a quote-unquote problem shift, right? So problem shift means that the question that you're answering is not really the same as it was at the beginning of the research program. And yet, uh, 
in some sense, you keep regarding yourself as continuing the same line of research, right? So I think that's just a more general version of what Neurod is saying, and this kind of and continuity through ambiguity would be a part of how the research program would accomplish that, right? We're trying to, we're still trying to measure the mass of the electron more accurately, but actually measuring the mass of the electron doesn't mean the same thing now as it used to mean, right? Because for one thing, mass doesn't mean the same thing after relativity as it used to mean, and electron also doesn't mean the same thing. So the problem has shifted. And yet, again, Lakatos is saying this is, this is part of what's important in the way science actually develops. And Putnam makes similar uh, remarks about the meaning of scientific terms, not here, but uh, most famously in his paper, which is called The Meaning of Meaning. <laughs> uh, so, um, so as I said, this, it's a common theme here that the kind of fixity of the meaning of terms, of the um, meaning of questions, the meaning of theories um, that uh, Popper and the positivists at least hold up as an ideal for science is it's not just that science is only approximately like that. It's that science really isn't like that. And the way and the fact that it's not like that is somehow important to how it actually makes progress. Um, now, so it's partly, at least as a consequence of this error that, which again, they think that Popper has in common with the positivists, that they think he's made um, a more characteristically Popperian error about um, falsification. So, um, um, because this kind of what, you know, one of the things that this kind of logical impurity or messiness, lack of logical cleanliness, um, to use a Nietzschean term, um, that uh, um, one of the uses of it in science, would Nietzsche agree with this? I think Nietzsche actually would agree with this, but never mind that. <laughs> uh, I'll probably be teaching Nietzsche again next year. <laughs> Interested. Um, I don't promise to say anything about this, though. Um, anyway, um, uh, so one of the things that this lack of cleanliness is for is precisely to allow us to hold on to theories or something like theories, research programs, encyclopedias, whatever, to allow us to hold on to them in the face of what, Pot what Popper would look at, at as falsifying evidence. Um, so, I mean, this is only uh, part of how we do that, I think, they, they all would say, but, um, but it's, you know, P Popper has missed this part in addition to the others, and um, um, so the overall point is that um, in general, we don't abandon our theories just because they've been uh, um, Neurot's term is that they've been shaken. Um, they've received a, a shock might be also uh, maybe a better way to translate what he says in German. 
Um, um, so one example of this is, uh, and this is an important example, Put Putnam and Lakatosh both bring this up, although actually Neurot doesn't. But um, um, it's the example of perihelion of Mercury. So do I, st I guess I still have room to write that. So, I mean, this is a famous example in the history of science uh, used by almost every philosopher of science to do something. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, as you may know, uh, in Newtonian mechanics, um, if you have two bodies, two point masses, um, and they're moving uh, around each other in a closed pattern. Well, I guess I shouldn't say closed, in a bounded pattern. That is, they're not moving, you know, away <laughs> and never coming back. Then each of them moves on the curve that's called an ellipse around the center of mass. So. Drawing out a very good drawing of the ellipse, the center of mass would be one of the foci of the ellipse. Um, if one of the bodies is much bigger than the other, then the center of mass is basically is much more massive than the other. I mean, then the center of mass of the whole system is basically where that massive body is. So, um, uh, if this is Mercury, <coughs> excuse me. You can basically think of this as the sun. Although, again, it's not really the sun. It's the center of mass of the Mercury-Sun system, which is a point somewhere inside the sun, but not the center of the sun. All right. So anyway, so if there were no other bodies in the universe and no other forces except Newtonian gravi gravitation, then uh, Mercury's orbit around the sun would be an ellipse, and um, to say that it's an ellipse means, you know, uh, since an ellipse is a curve, is a closed curve, it comes back to itself, so Mercury will keep moving on this same curve forever. And so whatever direction this is, um, this is the direction from the sun to the perihelion. I'm not going to write that word out. It just means the point where Mercury is closest to the sun um, will always stay the same forever. However, uh, of course, uh, there are other bodies besides Mercury and the sun in the universe. Um, in particular, there's some that are pretty close by, like Jupiter. So, you know, somewhere off here is Jupiter. Jupiter is not nearly as massive as, as, as the sun, um, but it's pretty massive. <laughs> it's also not as close to, the, to Mercury as the sun is, but it's not that far away. And so the gravity of Mercury has, of Jupiter, has some effect on the orbit of Mercury. And, you know, the way, because it's like a minor correction, you can understand the effects that Jupiter has on the orbit of Mercury by saying, well, the orbit of Mercury is basically like this, but there's certain perturbations, right? There's certain respects in which it's not exactly an ellipse. And one of the respects in which you would expect it to not be exactly an ellipse in the presence of other bodies is that this direction towards the perihelion changes slightly as time goes on. That's called the precession of the perihelion. Right? So what that really means is that Mercury's path isn't exactly an ellipse. 
that by the time it get back, gets back to here, it's kind of like done a little bit. Well, I'm making it take a little bit longer than this, I think. Anyway, so right, it kind of moves in like a rose shape, right? Like over time, the it's always almost moving on ellipse, but it, it always misses the ellipse it started with a little bit. And so over time, the ellipse rotates around the sun. So eventually you would come back and find it. You know, if you waited long enough, you would find it going on this angle. Okay, so far so good. There's no falsification of Newtonian mechanics here. Um, in fact, you know, one of the great successes of Newton himself was that he was able to explain a lot of the deviations of the planets from pure elliptical orbits by figuring out the perturbations that would be caused by the other planets. And as time went on, you know, people using Newton's theory were able to do that better and better. Um, but there was an anomaly in the case of Mercury, as opposed to the other planets, there was an anomaly. The, the perihelion processes a little bit faster than you would expect, even when you add in all the perturbations of the other planets. And no one was able to explain it. So notice that this is not a stray observation as Popper would put it. This is a genuine um, replicable effect. It keeps happening year after year. The, the perihelion of Mercury processes a little bit more than the, than the theory predicts. Um, in other words, it looks like what Popper would call a falsifying hypothesis. Now, um, Moreover, the truth is it really was a falsifying hypothesis. That is, we now know that the reason um, Mercury's orbit, and you can, you can only see this well in the case of Mercury's orbit because it's so close to the sun, and so the sun's gravitational field is, is extra strong compared to the orbits of the other planets, that... Um, the difference between Newtonian gravitation and Einstein's theory of general relativity shows up in the fact that Mercury's orbit processes faster than you'd expect. Right? So, I mean, this, this actually was a sign that Newtonian gravitation wasn't exactly right. But how did scientists react to it before general relativity came along? And the answer is they ignored it. <laughs> they, sh I mean, they didn't, you know, they shelved it. They said, unexplained anomaly. Probably someday we'll figure out why. Or they made some ad hoc hypotheses. Hmm, maybe there's some other, there's another planet inside the orbit of Mercury that somehow can account for this. But no one found a planet like that. And, uh, you know, as I said, they just, they said, we don't know why this happens. And they didn't give up the theory. And, you know, uh, they... Uh, so were they right not to give up the theory? Well, uh, suppose they had given it up right away. Um, a long time before Einstein, or before the mathematics that Einstein used or even developed, right? So long before anyone could have develop the theory of general relativity, and they would have had no theory to replace it with. So they would just have to gone back to saying, well, you know, we just, we can't predict where the planets will be. That seems like it would have been a real mistake and would have prevented Einstein's eventual advance if they had done it. Um, Right? So as all three of these people emphasize, not only don't we abandon our theory because of some anomaly like this, um, we, and not only don't we ab abandon it even in the face of inconsistencies 
right? So some part of our theory or of our theories as a whole contradicts some other part. Um, Popper would say, well, obviously at that point you have to give it up. It doesn't make any clear predictions because from a contradiction you can derive anything. But no, when that happens, we just keep using both parts and avoid the inconsistency in some way. Um, actually, uh, you know, modern physics is basically in that position right now at this moment and has been for decades, right? The, the theory of general relativity and, the, and quantum field theory are not really consistent um, with each other and the, the problem is just kind of swept under the rug. Um, kind of an infinite vacuum energy is just like disregarded. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so, and what we do do, as all three of them emphasize, is we wait until we have a better theory. Till that time, if our theory is working for us, um, for the most part, we just disregard or regard as problems for further study all the places where it's not working. Um, So, I mean, it should be clear, I mean, I already emphasized this, that um, this, of although of course this is a especially clear problem if you have the caricature of Popper, Popper who says, Every, the first time you find a falsifying instance, abandon your theory. Um, so, you know, um, for that popper, this would be a particularly obvious problem, but the truth is it's a problem for real popper, or it appears to be. Anyway, the response that, no, no, you know, I don't give it up right away, you need a falsifying hypothesis is not going to work because this is a falsifying hypothesis. And, you know, popper in his response says, Oh, you know, I always said we don't get rid of our theory until we have another theory. And then he points to what he said about the falsifying hypothesis. But the truth is the falsifying hypothesis is not another theory. In, in Popper's own terminology. So remember, I emphasized that before. The falsifying hypothesis doesn't have to be specifically universal. It can be numerically universal. Um, and, you know, it's certainly not a whole encyclopedia or research program as Neurath or Lakatos would demand. Right, and you can see that again from this example of Mercury, right? We can't replace Newtonian gravitation with the theory, quote unquote, that this is the way Mercury's orbit behaves. And we'll do any of the things that the theory of universal gravitation does. It's just a hypothesis about this one specific spatiotemporal region, this one thing, Mercury, and what it's going to do. So, um, Popper, in his reply, um, back on this page again, But I found that, in addition, supersensitivity with respect to refuting criticism was just as dangerous. There is a legitimate place for dogmatism, though a very limited place. He who gives up his theory too easily in the face of apparent refutations will never discover the possibilities inherent in his theory. Um, blah, blah, blah. As always, science is conjecture. You have to conjecture when to stop defending a favorite theory and when to try a new one. And he claims that this was his position already in the um, logic of scientific discovery. Um, 
Unfortunately, as you can see, he doesn't give a page number. I don't know where he says that explicitly in the logic of scientific discovery. I'm willing to believe that he says it and that I just don't remember where it is. I don't think it was in the reading assigned for this class, but I couldn't even rule that out. But anyway, um, you know, whether he said it then or not, uh, you know, I think this is the type of move he could make to meet this criticism. He's saying, look, um, even if you have a falsifying hypothesis, that doesn't automatically mean you should reject your theory. There certainly are places where it sounds like he's saying that in logic of scientific discovery. This is part of what has Lakatos confused about what he means. Certainly are places where he sounds like it's just simple. As soon as the falsifying hypothesis is confirmed, the theory is falsified and you reject it. But, you know, here it sounds like he's saying as Lakatosh, this is kind of what Lakatosh calls popper sub two, um, that, uh, um, no, the theory is falsified, but we don't reject it necessarily. That's a further methodological decision based on whether we have a better theory waiting, et cetera. Um, Okay, so that's the general line of criticism I think that all three of them take. Um, I want to discuss in a little more detail another example that they discuss and that Popper responds to. Um, this is also an example of celestial mechanics. Um, and also an example of calculation of perturbations in Newtonian celestial mechanics. Also very famous, it's the discovery of Neptune. So this again was a case, and in this case I don't know the details of um, exactly what the perturbations are that are observed, but um, um, so, uh, um, up to a certain time, there were, uh, seven known planets. Um, the, the six planets, well, that is five plus the earth that have been known since ancient times and Uranus, um, I'm not sure what the, dis the story of the discovery of Uranus is, but anyway, um, right, which Uranus can't be seen by the naked eye, so it was discovered after the invention of the telescope. Um, but when people looked at the orbit of Uranus, it turned out that it had certain unexplained perturbations, just like the orbit of Mercury has un had unexplained perturbations. So... Um, Again, I can't draw exactly what the perturbations look like, but you know, of course, you know, the ellipses that the planets move on are much closer to circles than the one that I drew before. Um, they're approximately circles, you know. So, um, you know, here's the orbit of Uranus around the sun. really around the center of mass of the solar system, but again, never mind that. Um, and, you know, observing it over many years, they discovered that it wasn't exactly the Newtonian model. So I'll just, you know, pretend it looks like that. Of, of course, you know, the perturbation is not that big. <laughs> um, so, um, So the question was, well, okay. So again, looks like a falsifying hypothesis, right? Here's our falsifying hypothesis. So again, the theory is Newtonian gravitation. The falsifying hypothesis is Uranus doesn't move on a 
um, uh, Newtonian orbit. And it seems like Popper should say that the theory is falsified. Um, so, um, so what actually happened? To get rid of this. So um, Putnam, I think, lays it out best in the difference between his schema one and schema two. Um, so schema one is, Putnam says, the one that both Popper and the inductivists are always thinking about. And it works like this. We have a theory. Now, and from the theory, we get certain predictions. And then the question is, are the predictions true or false? So, and that, you know, and then the inductivists say we care whether they're true and we care whether they're false, whereas Popper says we only care whether they're false, basically. Um, but Putnam points out that actually, for if you take the theory of Newtonian theory of gravitation, for example, um, we don't, oh, I'm sorry, I again forgot to, to switch to the board. Oops. Right, so this is schema one. We start with the theory and we get some predictions from it. Putnam points out is if you take a theory like Newtonian theory of gravitation, um, you can't get predictions out of it right away. Um, you have to add certain other, he calls them auxiliary statements. Also, AS, also my initials, the auxiliary statements. Um, so, for example, one auxiliary statement is that there are no bodies other than the Sun and, the, and Uranus in this case. Um, another one is that. Um, I don't know why he has to list this one separately because, but he lists separately. Another one is that they're moving in a vacuum, or a hard vacuum as he calls it. But of course, a vacuum that's not a hard vacuum isn't really a vacuum. So they're moving in a vacuum. You know, I mean, of course, if there were no other bodies, they, they would have to be moving in a vacuum. Uh, so again, I'm not sure why he adds that as a separate one. And then a third one is that there's no other forces acting on them. Right, because like if you imagine that uh, Uranus has a net electrical charge and the sun has a magnetic field, then uh, gravitation's not, you know, you wouldn't expect the orbit to come out Newtonian. That is, you wouldn't expect it to come out a Newtonian, the kind of orbit that's predicted by Newtonian gravitation. So, um, and actually the truth is if Uranus has a net electric charge, forget the magnetic field, it's gonna give off radiation as it goes around the sun and lose energy and it will eventually spiral in. Um, so, um, which because of gravitational radiation is actually, according to Einstein, is happening in a two-body 
the system. But okay, never mind that either. All right, so um, you have to make those auxiliary assumptions, and then you get out the prediction. But because of that, so I mean, f so far this is not like it's not clear that he's saying anything that Popper doesn't already say. And Popper's response is going to say, I already said that. Um, but um, what he, because again, Popper said that basic statements like Uranus will be at this and such and such place at such and such time are never implied by a theory by itself. But because of the way, the nature of the things that you have to fill in, that's what allows for what Putnam calls schema two. Theory. Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. And then, what does he call the third? Fact to be explained. This um, resembles the uh, this resembles the uh, plan of the underwear gnomes in the famous South South Park episode later to become a meme. I've wondered for a long time whether somehow they could have. The writers could have been alluding to Putnam when they <laughs> wrote that episode, but probably not. Anyway, <laughs> theory, question mark, question mark, question mark, fact to be explained. Um, so that is because, as Putnam says, we really think the theory is right. You know, we've been using it for a long time. It's succeeded in a lot of cases. Um, we're pretty sure it's a good theory. Now along comes this fact, and we don't ask whether the fact is predicted by the theory or not. And I mean, this is important to understand about what the criticism is here. The point is um, not that... Um, Um, that the fact is anomalous in the sense that we got a different prediction out of the theory. I mean, you know, we may be interested in it for the reason that using our old auxiliary statements, we, got, we did get a different prediction out of the theory. But when that happens, our reaction is not to think at all of comparing this fact to the actual prediction of the theory. Because the prediction wasn't a prediction of the theory. It was a prediction of the theory plus certain auxiliary statements. And we think the theory is right. And we know the fact is right. So, in, so instead of comparing, as using the theory in a hypothetical function, as Putnam puts it, right, asking if the theory then what, and comparing that to the fact, we say, well, obviously, since the theory is true and the fact is true, if the theory, then this fact, given certain auxiliary statements, and our problem is to find the auxiliary statements. Right? So we say, okay, given that we know what are, you know, the... Um, consequences of Newtonian gravitation, and we see 
Uranus with this orbit, what does that show that we have to assume? And so um, it was independently um, part of the question between Popper and Putnam is, is exactly how to describe what was independently done. <laughs> but it was independently come up with, with by two theorists after the discovery of this perturbation in the orbit of Uranus that um, uh, the problem was with the auxiliary statement that said, so now, I mean, to make it more realistic, of course, we didn't say there's no bodies anywhere except the sun and Uranus, but we said there's no bodies close by except the sun, Uranus, and the other planets, mostly Jupiter, right? I mean, but anyway, and all the other planets. So... Um, um, that was the old auxiliary statement, and what these people both proposed separately was that uh, here's a way to modify the auxiliary statements, say, and one other planet. And they were able to solve this problem to figure out exactly what to fill into those question marks. So meaning not just, they weren't, just able to say, maybe there's another planet and that could explain it. But they were able to say, the explanation is that there's another planet and this is the orbit of the other planet, right? So they were able to say, there's another planet with this orbit. And, you know, this is where it is in its orbit right now. Um, if you if you plug that into here, plus all the other auxiliary statements that you need, um, you get you explain the fact of how Uranus is observed to move. So then, sure enough, the Berlin Observatory, you know, using these people's prediction of where this other planet is supposed to be. Um, at various times. On a certain night, they turn their telescope in a certain direction, and there it is, Neptune. <laughs> that was the discovery of Neptune. Um, so it's actually a triumph of Newtonian gravitation, as opposed to the Mercury story, where it was, you know, although no one realized that it was the it was the sign that there was something wrong all along. In this case, it was, you know, an amazing achievement. Because, I mean, it, it's not easy to find a new planet. We're still not sure that there isn't another one out there, <laughs> right? Like a body the size of the Earth or Mars somewhere out in the Kuiper Belt or whatever. Um, and, you know, and we have these digital sky surveys and whatever. We have much more information than people used to have in the past. Um, so, I mean, the idea that someone could take a slight discrepancy in observations of Uranus and say to the observer, hey, on such and such a night, point your telescope in this direction, um, and there it is, is like an amazing, well, corroboration of the theory, basically, right? So the question is, um, however, whether Popper can account for this. And both Lakatos and Putnam say that um, Popper can't account for this because, again, when we got in this situation, we didn't at all treat it as a potential test of the theory. We didn't say, well, first of all, we certainly didn't treat it as if the theory had already been falsified, which is, again, what it seems like Popper should say. Here's a falsifying hypothesis, and it's been confirmed. Um, but moreover, um, we didn't even treat it as a case where the theory could be falsified. We didn't treat it as a case where the theory was in danger. Because um, 
Um, the thing that was contradicted by the observation was not a prediction of the theory, but a prediction of the theory plus some auxiliary statements. And the auxiliary statements, you know, the theory we think is right, but the auxiliary statements we don't think are probably right. I mean, in fact, we know they're for sure that they're not completely right. Realize we know there are other bodies in the solar system besides the planets and the sun. There's asteroids and moons and all kinds of other stuff. Um, you know, um, uh, um, I don't know exactly what how much people took into account when they did these calculations, but they certainly didn't, you know, calculate the perturbation that's a result of every asteroid, you know, because it's negligible, right? So in other words, we already know that these auxiliary statements are not exactly true. As opposed to the theory of universal gravitation, which we think, at least suspect strongly, is really exactly true, the auxiliary statements we know are just approximations to make the problem easier, basically. So when we get in this situation, we don't even think of falsifying the theory. We just, we treat it as a puzzle. How do we have to adjust those auxiliary statements that we, were nev we never really thought were completely true anyway? How do we have to adjust them to get the right answer out? So from that fact, it looks like the way Popper describes the progress of science is wrong because um, in the case of certain kinds of facts at certain times in the history of, of certain theories, um, we uh, don't treat the facts as potential falsifiers, and given the way theories are used, we really couldn't or wouldn't be reasonable to treat them as potential falsifiers. Um, So this is getting towards a more serious criticism of Popper. Um, it's close to what we're going to say. See Kuhn saying, although um, uh, Kuhn doesn't, unlike these people, doesn't present himself as criticizing Popper. Mainly, he's developing his own view. Um, but it's getting close to what you could call Kuhn's criticism of Popper. Um, and as I'm sure you noticed, if you read the Putnam piece, Putnam actually mentions Kuhn um, in his paper and says that his own view is, is he actually claims to have anticipated Kuhn. Um, I think um, that's true kind of only if you take from Kuhn exactly what Putnam wants to take from him and nothing else, because Putnam says, of course, I don't, you know, agree with Kuhn completely, but the part that he doesn't agree with is the important part. So anyway, be that as it may, I will have plenty of time to talk about Kuhn later. Um, so this is getting to a serious um, criticism of Popper. However, it's not as if Popper doesn't have a response to this still. Um, Um, so the initial response is just to say, I said this all along. 
and to kind of make fun of Putnam's weird, emphatic way of writing. By the way, he talked exactly like this too. So, like, basic sentences are deducible from theories. Like, that's how he would have said that. Oh, <laughs> he felt impelled to represent that in writing too by putting it in all capitals. Um, so anyway, um, um, Popper says, truly, uh, I never said that basic statements are deducible from theories. The truth is, I have pointed out dozens of times that no basic statements are deducible from any universal theory. And that's definitely true. And then he goes on, what I have asserted is that basic statements may sometimes contradict a theory. This means that the negations of these basic statements will be deducible from that theory. And I pointed out that in general, negations of basic statements are not in their turn basic statements. Right, so um, Popper says, look, I said all along that you need these auxiliary statements and he says, called by me initial conditions. You need to put them in to get a basic statement out of the theory. So I always agree that you don't get, this theory doesn't predict any basic statements on its own. But he said, he says, I also always said that the theory does forbid certain basic statements. So what kind of basic statements does the theory forbid? Well, so, Um, so, right, if the prediction is, um, you know, Uranus will be in such and such a place at such and such a time. The theory doesn't predict that because it's only the theory plus the initial condition, the initial conditions, which Popper is saying are the same as Putnam's auxiliary statements. It's the theory plus the initial conditions that predict, that yield that prediction. Uranus will be in such and such a place at such and such a time. This would all be very funny if I said Uranus instead of Uranus, but I'm not going to do that. Could that be the connection to the South Park episode? All right, never mind. All right. Uh, so, um, um, so, but that means that the theory done is contradicted by this statement. The initial conditions hold and the prediction is false, right? So the theory said, if initial conditions, then basic statement, and therefore the theory rules out initial conditions and not basic statement. So the theory said, assuming blah, 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 Uranus will be here at such and such a time. Um, so the theory forbids blah, 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 and Uranus will not be there at such and such a time. And that's a basic statement, says Popper. And he also adds something else about the case of Neptune in particular. This is actually in his response to Lakatosh, not in his response to Putnam. So you can only understand exactly what he's responding to a part of Lakatosh's paper that I didn't assign, and you can only understand exactly what he's saying here by reading that. But basically, um, Lakatosh ignores the fact that almost all possible kinds of misbehavior would not be explicable by postulating the existence of a planet P prime. Thus, Lakatosh's characteristic story is in fact an extremely exceptional case. So the point he's making here is um, that uh, 
if you look at Uranus and see its its orbit behaving in any random way, almost all of those ways couldn't be explained by adding in one more planet. Um, right, adding one in one more planet, depending on how big it is and where it is and so forth, it will account for various possible perturbations. But it's, you know, limited the kind of shapes that you can get that way. Most things, like an example that Popper discusses later, if you saw a planet whose orbit was shaped like a rectangle, so, I mean, you can't get that by adding one more planet. And, you know, you can't get that by adding any reasonable mass distribution. But, I mean, so leave out that last part, although it's true and it may be important, but you can't get it by explaining, by adding any one planet anywhere. So Popper says that what Adams and Leverrier, or Leverrier, however that's pronounced, um, proposed, uh, or what, what they conjectured when they said, okay, let's add this hypothesis onto the theory. There's another planet. Was actually um, a strengthening of the theory. It was adding something uh, improbable to the theory to make it more falsifiable, basically. Um, it was uh, not at all like saying, uh, well, maybe there's a force that makes Uranus do this, <laughs> right? It was not at all an ad hoc adjustment to the theory in order to save it in the face of apparent falsification. It was a bold new hypothesis. Um, and uh, right, the actual discovery of Neptune was a priori improbable in the extreme. That was the same point I made, right? Like you could, if you just have one telescope and you just point it at random places in the sky every night, then even if there are lots and lots of undiscovered planets, you almost certainly will never see one. Yeah, and again, I mean, we've only been able to make, to put some bounds on where there could be new planets now because we have, we have in effect, telescopes that take a picture of the entire sky over and over again. Um, but, right, so the way they actually did this, it was improbable in the extreme. And uh, so, uh, according to Popper, this actually was an instance of some of, of people testing the theory exactly the way he says they should. Um, oops, why is this not? Oh, it's already on. Oh wait, I didn't switch to this when I read it, did I? Lakatos ignores the fact that almost all possible kinds of misbehavior would not be explicable by postulating the existence of a planet P prime. Thus, Lakatos's characteristic story is in fact an extremely exceptional case. Adams and Leverrier success in pinpointing the planet P prime. Neptune was by no means a trivial or expected success. It was a far from straightforward calculation and the actual discovery of Neptune was a priori improbable in the extreme. So again, this means what they did was actually to test the theory exactly the way I said you should. So how good of, his re of, of a response is that? Well, I mean, um, first of all, it's not really true that Putnam's auxiliary statements are the same as Popper's uh, initial conditions or boundary conditions, right? Because um, Pop Putnam's auxiliary statements are not basic statements. Right, like one of them is there are no other forces acting other than gravitation. That's not a basic statement. Um, another is uh, there are no other bodies other than the ones we know about. 
That's also not a basic statement, right? So you can't, when you plug those in here, you don't get a basic statement, right? So although the theory does contradict, there's no other forces and there's no other bodies and Uranus is not here at such and such a time, that thing that it contradicts is not itself a basic statement. Right? There does not exist and a so-and-so is um, a prime example of something that's unfalsifiable and therefore metaphysical according to Popper. Right? Like there does not exist a white raven or whatever. Um, and also, so granted that what the scientists did in the case of the discovery of Neptune could be construed the way it actually worked out as testing the theory the way Popper says you should. Um, if that's supposed to mean that if it had failed, they would have given up the theory, then that doesn't sound right. Right? In other words, like it was a great success. It seems like ammunition for what Lakatosh and Neurath and Putnam all say, which is that a lot of our trust in science is in fact built on its successes and not on its um, um, not on the failure of some other theory, basically. By the way, so I mean Popper doesn't exactly disagree with that. Right? Remember, as a psychological matter, Popper agrees that we actually do believe things more and more the more times we see them repeated. I mean, it's, you know, again, this has something to do with how to interpret Hume. Hume agrees with that. Goodman says, and what people don't realize is that Hume thinks that's a solution to his problem. But Popper is saying on his own behalf, but also presumably attributing this to Hume, um, that's, it's true that as a psychological matter, we believe things are going to happen again due to custom, due to habits, due to association, but that doesn't answer the real problem, which is why it's rational to do that. And the answer to that problem is negative. It's not rational to do it. Anyway, so, sorry, that was a little bit of digression, but it's important. Um, so, um, um, so, uh, So what Popper says in response, although it's strictly speaking true, this again is what I said to begin with, they each misread each other or present each other misleadingly. It's strictly speaking true that Putnam has disregarded certain things that Popper says, and Lakatosh too, I guess. But uh, it's not true that if you put those back in, he would obviously have a good response to this. So how could he actually respond to this? I think um, he does say something that could be taken as aimed at it. Um, I'm not going to go into that because we're running low on time and I want to get to the next thing. But I'll just say that, you know, basically, like, to have a, a real response to this, Popper has to say the same thing I saw him perhaps hinting at before or, or claiming that he always thought, but it's by no means clear that he always thought this. Namely, that um, actually in a situation like this, it, you know, giving up the theory might not be the right thing to do. I mean, it's still going to be a good question, but maybe he would say this is a psychological question. Do the scientists even think of that possibility? 
of giving up the theory in the face of this. But anyway, what, you know, he would say, you know, it's methodologically speaking, whatever the psychological explanation is, they're right not to give up the theory every time there's an anomalous, even a falsifying hypothesis in the absence of a better theory. So in that case, we can say, well, the theory is technically falsified, but methodologically speaking, it's not time to reject it yet. Um, and since it's not time to reject it yet, what should we do? This is what Lakatosh complains that Popper never explains this. But, you know, so what we should do is instead change some auxiliary hypotheses, which are not initial conditions, but are like other lesser theories that we have floating around, basically. Theories that we might even know are not exactly right, um, that we're using to get predictions out. Um, and so how can you tell then? That would be the obvious question. How can you tell, Popper? I thought the whole point of falsification is it's supposed to make it clear. Now you can't keep holding on to your theory. You have to give it up. So Popper will say, well, but it was never the logical fact of falsification that had that implication. What I was recommending methodologically is that you try to put your theory in a position where that could happen to it. When it looks like it might actually have happened, you have a methodological decision to make. Is it time to give it up now or should we try to fix it a little bit longer? And how can we know? And Popper will say, well, you have to guess. Maybe you'll be wrong. <laughs> That's, you know, what he always says. Um, and that's related to something I want to see in the next three minutes, <laughs> um, which is um, about, generally speaking, what Lakatos calls the meta criterion. So the meta criterion would be all these bad linguistic habits, like normative and meta and whatever, are popping up in Lakatosh. Uh, anyway, all the ticks that have come to dominate philosophical language. But, you know, Lakatosh says, his discovery of Neptune. Popper, when would you give up your criterion of demarcation? And it's actually funny. In the reply to Lakatosh, Popper says, you know, based on Lakatosh's paper, I now have a new answer. If Professor Lakatosh could convince me that Newton's theory is no more falsifiable than Freud's, I would give up my criterion. <laughs> um, so, I mean... Of course, Popper thinks, but he can't, right? He thinks he's, you know, he's shown why that's bogus. But, uh, um, but it does, does show, and this is going to be important for understanding Kuhn, it does show that Popper is in some way vulnerable to an attack based on the, the kind of attack that, that these three people are making based on the history of what scientists actually do. Right? If it turns out that they really at all, don't do at all what he claims they're doing, in particular, let's say if it turns out that they don't even try to falsify theories ever, <laughs> um, that they avoid at all costs a situation where a theory might be falsified, um, then it's going to be bad news for Popper's suggestion. Okay, but in any case, uh, but the last thing I want to say about this in the last minute is that um, um, as far as the version of it that's put forward by Lakatosh and perhaps implicitly by Putnam and Neurath as well, I think Popper does have one more thing to say about this, which is that, you know, um, 
Lakatos says we need a kind of empirical meta-criterion to decide when to give up the criterion. And in principle, we need a meta-meta-criterion and all the way up. But then Lakater says, but you know, one must stop somewhere. So Putnam, uh, Popper in his reply says, my view doesn't involve this infinite regress. What does he mean by that? What I think he means by it is this. We have We have a methodological principle of rationality, which is, as I said a long time ago, basically an ethical principle. It says what to do given the fact that we are the type of fallible beings that tend to believe things without, even though they're not justified. We know we will. How should we react in that situation? So, this is not a prediction about what's going to happen in the world at all. It's a practical, ethical principle. Popper thinks that from that, we can see, you know, um, what makes this thing that we call science good because it has a structure that allows us to follow that principle. But um, it doesn't go any farther up than this. It goes from theory to practice, and then it stops. <laughs> right? That is, there's nothing before the question of what is the responsibility of a rational being with respect to knowledge. Um, you know, the buck stops here. I don't know that Popper, unlike Kant, can give a like really detailed explanation of why the buck stops there, <laughs> um, but I think that's his position. Okay, I've gone over time, so uh, I could say more about this, but I will not. And uh, I'll see you next week. Have a good Thanksgiving. Bye.